All right, you guys have asked for this over and over and over again, and here it is, a comparison of Minsk and Moscow. Now, of course, I've lived here in Minsk for almost two years, and I've spent a bit of time in Moscow as well. So let me break down some of the basics for you. I'll start with the least controversial cost of living activities and move to things like uh, safety, crime, and dating culture towards the end. So first of all, cost of living. Well, it's a bit mixed. It's not as obvious as you might think. So certainly for rents, Minsk is a lot cheaper. Uh, there's a lot more capacity here. It's not bursting at the seams uh, like Moscow feels like it is sometimes. So definitely for rents, Minsk is cheaper. But for your basic foodstuffs, for example, and your imported things like a phone or what have you, uh, Moscow is actually cheaper than Minsk. Although it's a bit more complicated. Let me turn you around. You can watch where we're going. Oh, there's our friend. It's a bit more complicated because there's more levels in Moscow. Moscow's a developed economy, yeah? Uh, Minsk is still, you know, we're still kind of a bit more uh, communist one income level kind of economy. So in Moscow, even though your basic stuff's probably a little bit cheaper, there's levels. There's a lot of levels up, a lot of levels of well-established, you know, restaurant qualities and uh, you know, bars and all this kind of stuff, right? So in that way, it's a bit different. Oh, let's stop here. I won't push my luck. This guy's helping his mate there with a uh, fuck something fell over. He's got a Green Bay Packers hat, so I'm guessing that guy's possibly American. Um, who knows? Um, so yeah, uh, Moscow is cheaper for basic stuff, but as you go uh, up the food chain, there is a food chain to go up. Yeah, if you want expensive, you'll find it there. Minsk, look, there's nicer places here. There's definitely some stuff going on, but even the nicer places aren't kind of that expensive, really. Um, but if you want that infrastructure, you want lots of uh, you know levels of things in terms of restaurant quality, bars going out, that kind of stuff. Moscow just wins. I mean, Minsk is still. You know, in a lot of ways, much more like a second-tier Russian city, right? Um, and yeah, just on the imported stuff, I wanted to mention this because this has nothing to do with sanctions or anything else. This is um, a long-standing government policy to tax imports. <clears throat> and so what you find is stuff's really expensive, like phones and stuff. Like I was just looking then, because we're going to go back to Australia in about a month's time. And I'm like, oh, I'm kind of due for a new phone. I dropped this one the other day when I was working out. It's like a big crack in the back of it now. It's like, eh, it's three years old. I'll... Just suss out my options, mate. I'll suss them out. So I looked here, and the phone I wanted was around, could you imagine, 40% more expensive in Belarus <clears throat> compared to Melbourne, right? So, you know, this is, uh, this is some difference. Uh, you know, it's probably like a month's rent or something. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's not as clear-cut as you might think. If you want to live large, yeah, Moscow's going to be more expensive. But if you want to live small... Uh, Moscow in a lot of ways is going to be cheaper. Uh, in terms of activities and stuff to do, look, per capita, Minsk would actually win this. On, on net, on, on aggregate, sorry. Yeah, of course, Moscow's got more stuff happening, right? Because it's bigger. But uh, Minsk per capita probably has more stuff going. Belarusians are into activities, man. They love to do stuff. They love festivals and blah, 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 blah. So they're very uh, into this kind of lifestyle. So you'll always find stuff to do. You just got to know where to find it, know where to look for it. And kind of get in the in the loop, right? In Minsk, and those expats kind of aren't. They just kind of, you know, work and hang out with a few mates and go on a few online dates and yeah, blah, blah. this is kind of expat life that seems to replicate itself around the planet. Um, that's kind of a more normal situation. But yeah, if you can get in the loop, there's a lot of activities, a lot of festivals, uh, a lot of just stuff to do. There is in Moscow as well, but yeah, pound for pound, Belarusians love this kind of stuff. They're really all about it. Uh, but yeah, in general, as I said, Minsk is, still feels a lot like a, a, a Yekaterinburg. Well, no, a bit bigger than Yekaterinburg, it feels. Maybe Kazan. But that's kind of where it's at, right? Um, but Minsk is definitely a little bit greener as well. Some of those second-tier Russian cities are pretty grim, to be fair. <clears throat> pretty, uh, you know, communist feeling. Uh, whereas Minsk uh, has pretty well-organized green areas. Oh, let's push this. Let's get across. Oh, just made it just made it uh, as long as you get your foot on the road when it's green you're good to go which side do you guys want to walk on it's a bit sunny but let's go on the other side and there's more happening more people around so this is uh Karl Marx Street if you don't know we're walking up from Plos Nina walking north this is kind of your key uh, cafe area here 
uh, of course, Café de Paris and one of the Pauls, one of the paragraphs. Pretty uh, familiar, very expat-y, very uh, thoughty kind of region where expats and thoughts collide. Karl Marx Street. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, Minsk pound for pound probably has some more greener areas. Uh, I would definitely say there's a paragraph. It's quite nice. I don't mind these places. Three of these in Minsk. Uh, I think it's from uh, Brest originally. Uh, there's one in Brest, and they built three here. And Paul's Cafe as well. This is obviously very. Uh, it's just a franchise here. <clears throat> I think there's quite a few of them in Europe, but they're pretty popular here in Minsk. Quite a few kicking around again. Foreigners and thoughts are the main. Uh, Oh, this has got complicated. Let's push through a bit. Um, yeah, expats and thoughts uh, as your target market down here primarily. Um, yeah, so Belarus, uh, Minsk has a few more green areas. Although Russia itself has, you know, wonderful nature and so forth. But I think in terms of, you know, comparing green space in uh, Minsk, comparing it to, say, the similar sized city in Moscow, um, a, a Kazan or Yekaterinburg or Novosibirsk obviously um, Minsk is kind of a bit greener a bit more livable in that sense uh, alright what's next let's talk about safety crime safety this kind of stuff um, look Minsk is obviously I don't know if it's the safest capital city in the world I'd say it probably is I mean Tokyo and, and Singapore uh, look, maybe they can compete, but I think in the end, Belarus, uh, Minsk is probably the safest. So, in terms from a crime point of view, um, uh, you know, petty crime stuff that people are concerned about, pickpockets and this kind of business, just, that's just not going to happen here. It's just it's so far from the fabric of the culture, you can't imagine. Um, so, that definitely going to happen here. Look, Moscow, it's not dangerous, honestly. It's not dangerous, but it's not Minsk, right? <clears throat> but it's not a place I'd go to. It's like, oh, it's too dangerous to go to Moscow. I'll go to Minsk and sit. It's nothing like that. I mean, Moscow is probably on a par with Melbourne. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Just a, a, a simple run of the mill Western city. A bit more petty crime. Just got to watch yourself a bit at night. Nothing major. So Moscow is still pretty decent. Just normal. But yeah, Minsk is freakishly safe. Um, on every level. It's pretty crazy. So, that's safety. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, girls and dating culture. Um, well, dating cultures are actually kind of similar. You've got, you kind of 20 years and under, and that's when you get like a wide range of people, and people kind of get together pretty quickly through social circle. And then once you pass about 22, look, it's primarily passport hunters and transactions, man. That's just the reality of these, these Slavic cultures. And then once you pop past about maybe 32 or 35, it kind of morphs back into, well not back into, but into a more like a Western style dating situation. You got, um, in Moscow, you got a glut of 30 something singles never married. In Minsk, you don't have that yet. It's very different in that regard. So Minsk still has uh, people get married very young. Uh, they never really get on the shelf, so to speak. Uh, whereas Moscow, you got yeah, that longer term career girl it's more of a thing, so he's got a whole lot of leftovers. So if you're a Western guy wanting to date in that range, unmarried, no kids, that's where you'll find a lot of them. Whereas in Minsk, you won't find any. And if you do, geez, the chance of it being pretty crazy is bloody high, to be quite frank. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you also get your divorcees as well, which I always recommend to guys here, especially if you're like 50 or so. I think getting yourself a nice 35 year old, freshly divorced girl, even if she's got a kid. Um, yeah, they don't really, uh, how do I say this politely? They, they let the kids kind of do their own thing here, shall we say. So typically, you know, when the kids pass about 11 or 12, you wouldn't even know that a woman has a kid. You know what I mean? Like the kid just does whatever. So that's kind of how it is here. They, they call it independent. Um, you can maybe think of other words, but. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no, nothing wrong with dating a girl who, you know, might've got married at 18 or 20, popped out a kid, <clears throat> got divorced at 32. Um, they'll be back on the market and they're kind of, you know, just more decent people, essentially. Because as I say, once you get past that initial get together age, which kind of stops at around 2021, 20, uh, what's left over is a bit grim. You know what I mean? Like you'll notice, you know, in the videos here, you're seeing a lot more 
Turks and Arabs and Westerners and it probably tells you a bit about um, the culture of gender interactions in 20s in the 20s you know? that's kind of the reality of it sad to sad to say and it's interesting it might sound a bit negative to you or a bit mean or whatever but you know as I say I mean most of your interactions here or Moscow with women in their 20s are going to be more passport huntery transactionally otherwise they're taken man they're taken they're off the market dude the guys here are thirsty if the girl's even half decent she is off the market bro so if she's left on the market there's a real reason for it it's her choice uh, which means she doesn't really like men much and she's thinking more about just herself and men are more a vehicle to money right it's just sad but it's kind of how it is now there will be exceptions from time to time but as a broad dating culture that's what you've got you've got similar in the, the cities in that again the 20 20 and under crew are finding their feet um, organically finding their future husband and wife then the leftovers are uh, from a female perspective are generally transactional girls passport hunters hyper narcissists that's kind of what left over but then it, it turns into more like a market situation maybe early to mid 30s as divorcees come onto the market and dynamic changes again so again in both cities it's kind of a bit similar there will be exceptions yeah there are exceptions because people a good exception a good example of an exception would be a girl that might have gone overseas for a few years comes back she's 27 yeah maybe could be okay um definitely the only ones i've ever met in that age range that you know could you could even have this have a simple relationship with have been overseas for a period of time uh, so uh that's i don't know made them more reasonable made them less princessy made them maybe the selection bias those who go overseas are a bit more western already in their mentality um therefore a bit more reasonable as people perhaps or a bit more warm as people <clears throat> than the other leftovers that tend to be on the shelf here during that time. But anyway, um, yeah, so dating cultures are pretty similar, except that there's a lot of singles never married 30 plus in Moscow. There's a glut, which you're gonna get in big cities, right? You're gonna get the career girls, sold the lie, blah, blah, blah. And now they're kind of barren and uh, in, in their one bedroom apartment. Um, but Minsk, you just don't get that. And again, if you get a girl who's single, never married here, that age range, Jesus, you want a red flag, mate? Fucking hell. Red flag that would bloody black out the sun, mate, the size of that cloud. It says a bit on dating culture. Let me think if I can think of anything else. Um, oh, yeah, I think, look, <clears throat> Minsk is a bit more tightly held, yeah? Like, Minsk... Um, like Moscow, you just get a lot of dudes from I don't know where just hanging out, you know? And the police there are constantly asking for passports to check if they're legitimate or not. So there has been some, uh, I know from some Russians I know in Moscow, there has been some uh, problems with violence with them. Nothing major, yeah, just a few instances. Because they don't, you know, these countries don't put up with that shit much. So that stuff kind of gets sorted out. Uh, but yeah, in Minsk, no one would try anything, man. No one would try any shit like that. But in Moscow, people mainly don't either. Yeah. But yeah, there was a lot of um, passport checking and checking who's actually supposed to be in the country and who isn't. You kind of had that going on in Moscow. <clears throat> uh, my buddy who is... Uh, fuck, what genetics is he? He's an American guy, but he looks... Uh, oh, he looks like he could be, you know, half... Oh, fuck if I know. Azerbaijani or something? You know what I mean? Like, just some kind of uh, light mix, but kind of more on the European side. Uh, he got stopped. They patted him down, checked his passport. They were polite and everything, but just checking. Whereas me, with the obviously European descent, they're like, well, this guy's uh, whatever. Oh, actually, shit. One thing I forgot. This is hot off the press, too. Just happening now. Is uh, So that thing that happened in Moscow, in the Bolshoi Theater, uh, that bombing and uh, sorry the shooting the terrorist attack there's a hundred odd got killed there um, this has changed entry into Russia a lot because typically what you find is Belarus keep an eye on you right whereas Russia is just too big like there's this big unruly beast and they just no one does their job or gives a fuck basically so 
you can kind of go in and out of Moscow or Russia without anyone really caring. Whereas Belarus, you know, you, you will be watched at some stage. Yeah, they, they're keeping things a bit tighter, which has its benefits. Unless you're a political opponent, it has its benefits, right? Uh, but in Russia, they're loose with that stuff. It's just, as I say, no one does their job. No one really cares, but that's just changed. Man, the last month or two in particular, this has really changed. And I just have a friend from France who <clears throat> actually lives in Russia. He has a car there, uh, rented an apartment, but a car he owns. Russian bank account with a good deposit of rubles in there. And he just got uh, stopped at the border, coming back in, Ask about his visa. It's not a typical kind of visa that you get when you know people, if you know what I mean. So there's no problems there. They're just asking questions about it. Um, uh, he actually got the visa through me. <laughs> um, so that was fine. But then they started checking his phone, yeah? And uh, they saw all these memes in there. And he's one of these guys that's very uh, pro-Russian, anti-Ukrainian, right? So he's kind of got these, these kind of memes on his phone. I don't know. There was on Twitter or something, and it got uh, cached, and, and then you get cached, and then you could still see them. So anyway, they're checking his phone for three hours at the border and going to Russia and they see all this kind of pro-Russian and Ukrainian stuff but because the sarcasm of Western memes goes over the head of the average uh, Russian border patrol agent, he got denied entry. And then uh, we kind of asked around uh, unofficially if you know what I mean and turns out he's also now been put on a list here so he can't come to Belarus either. Could you imagine? So that was kind of interesting and I've heard a few situations different guys I know uh, who've been stopped at the border for long periods of time but everyone else has been let through eventually but often with you know three or four hours of questioning or whatever so they're really careful I think do they have an election coming up next year as well is that right we have an election here early next year um, I have a feeling oh, I, know, I could have that wrong uh, I'm not super political to be fair but nonetheless, that they could be paying more attention. That's what they're doing here as well, right? Like those people coming in. Uh, I won't say too much more, but there were people kind of coming in, if you know what I mean, <coughs> late towards last year, and the government was really clamping down on this and really checking people and following people a bit and just sussing out who's who in the zoo, so to speak, who's here to cause trouble, who's not. Um, so maybe the Russians are doing something similar now. But as I say, in Russia, fucking hell, mate, it's a big unruly beast. You got all these old blasts with their own political, like my blast is just like a state or a region or territory within Russia that's got their own, you know, their own agenda and their own ideas, and it, it, it's, a, it's a big unruly mess, old Russia. It's a lovely country, and I do recommend that you do <clears throat> try and get there at some stage in your life. But uh, it, it is not really, a, a, you know, it's very different to Belarus. Belarus is kind of ethnically Belarusian with just little, you know, chut uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Lithuanian, just choo choo, right? Maybe 5%, 10% people have some of this genetics, especially down closer towards the Polish side, you're going to be more Polish genetics, but uh, that's it, right? Uh, whereas Russia is just, <laughs> I mean, it's got entire ethnic, micro ethnic oblasts that are dedicated to that ethnicity, right? So it's kind of a, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a Soviet Union in that sense, like a whole lot of countries put together and then under the flag of Russia. Whereas Belarus is kind of just Belarus. So anyway, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed our chat today about the difference between Belarus, uh, or should I say Minsk and Moscow. I'm just thinking from a practical point of view for guys that might want to live in either. But look, at the end of the day, like they're probably not that different. Minsk is a little bit more kind of small townish. Moscow has more economic opportunities, more of an economy. If you want to actually make some money, start a business, whatever, you'd probably rather do that in Russia. But again, there's, there's hindrances for business in both countries, whether it's uh, government or kind of you know, local standover men or competitors or whatever. That the, the complications are different in both countries, but they <coughs> exist in both countries. But yeah, the, the chance of making money if you want to do that is certainly a lot higher in Moscow. Certainly a lot more welfare, a lot more developed economy. Um, although, you know, not that many people have money, to be fair, but the opportunities exist. Alright guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. Let me know what you think if you've been to Minsk and Moscow uh, or even just one of them. Let me know what you think uh, about these cities.